for in inviting me, Matt, and uh, thank all of you for being here. And I'm going to talk about small stuff. I'm not very comfortable with big ideas. But in order to get there, you have to take steps. So I'm, I'm the step-by-step -step person here. I'm going to talk very specifically about uh, the Iowa legislature and what it could do to make it easier for us to take those steps. When I say steps, I look at Miriam, who took I don't know how many steps across the United States for, for, for climate change. And uh, yeah, this is who I am. I'm, uh, I'm an emeritus professor also in, um, at the University of, of Iowa, and that, that'll make sense in a, in a couple of uh, a couple of slides, but mainly I work for something called the uh, Iowa Policy Project. We're a not-for-profit here in, uh, in Iowa, not here, but in Iowa City, pretty close to here. And uh, we do a number of things, including work on the environment. So, the next slide. What, what I am talking about is policy. Now, there's a lot of individual action. There are a lot of people who are doing things like, like Marion, who step out and say, climate change is really important to me, and I'm going to give up stuff in order to have it happen. Greta, this little girl in uh, Sweden who's not going to school and uh, saying, this is just too important. Going to school is fine. I'd like to learn stuff, but i got to stand up for this. Now, individual action really means a lot. There's, I, I'm not ever going to undervalue that. Uh, and you become an example to other people. Uh, Greta certainly has become an example to all sorts of students all around the, United, uh, all around the world. And, uh, but also, we get something out of that. Because in these kinds of times, when you see all the bad that's going on, I think you have to do something to make you feel better. So... And it actually matters a little bit. It matters. And so, but if you move from that individual action to policy, what you do is you multiply all of that good stuff that some people might want to do, might want to do. Um, solar panels on somebody's house is really good. But when I saw those solar panels coming <laughs> into this place, my golly, I don't know how how much that is, but it's a nice array of solar. Yeah, it's on the roof, too. On the roof, too? I'm sorry? 429. How many kilowatts do we have? How many kilowatts? Yeah. Somebody asked me that 165 kilowatts. No, more than that. It's more than Okay, that's still so quite a bit. Okay. It's, it's, it's the idea is to power this building. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, and it was very exciting to see that. Panels, and, and pa panels on colleges would be great. I mean, Luther is amazing big wind turbine, all kinds of solar. University of Iowa sucks. We just <laughs> do not do very much. And it's an embarrassment. Michigan State took something the size of the Hancher lot, covered it with solar panels, and made the cars not as warm during the summer, and also generated all kinds of power. Yeah. And also, policy can make... And this is the best thing, and this is where I want to go. Policy, when you do it right, can make those individual actions more possible. Next slide shows you that. And the next slide is, here is uh, Peter Thorne, who's in this, in, uh, comes to this society. Those are the panels on uh, his garage. Those are the panels on my garage. That's when they were actually being installed. Both of us had about the same. These are two kilowatt systems, roughly. This is a little, better, a little bigger than mine. One, two, he had eight panels, I had seven, but, you know, about the same. Both of us decided to do that. Next slide. Now, we probably would have done that, because we taught a class together on climate change. And, uh, really, you got to have some credibility when you're going to do that, right? And so, Peter and I were committed to doing that. But on the other hand, policy meant that 30% of the cost of those panels were paid by lowering our federal taxes. 15 came from uh, lowering our state taxes, and mainly net metering, giving us a fair price when we produce those kilowatt hours. 
for both Peter and me, with small systems. We are going to be giving power back to the grid only occasionally, because first of all, the power comes in and powers our house, and then that extra amount goes out, but that extra amount is produced in the middle of August on a hot day when the company needs that electricity. We are giving them exactly the best power that they can get that alternatively they would have to spend a lot of money to get. We did all that because we're good guys, man, Peter. But we got all of that back in order to make it easier for us to do it so that many, many poor pe more people would also do that. And that's what policy can do for you. Next slide. How do we get that 15%? Well, it's a, it's a good idea that we've reproduced, I think, about 20 times that. I, I think there are at least that many of these tours, solar tours. Oh, yeah. At least 20 in our, we're, we're part of something called the energy table. And um, we copy one another, steal this idea is one of the things we, we do when we get together. And this is with the first one, 2011. And this person right here, and this person, and this person, and this person, all of those are state legislators, either senators or representatives. And the rest of us are, you know, on this bus. Got a bus, got invited the legislators to come with us to see what kind of solar was already going on in their neighborhood and got this guy and the reason at least the guys came along in that bus is because that's Tim Dwight football <laughs> hero at the University of Iowa maybe you didn't want to ride a bus with me but you sure might want to do it with Tim Tim really helped that thing get started. And, and again, we've done about 20 of these, and that's one of the reasons that we have a chance in the attack on public policy going on right now. Next slide, please. Wait, say that last thing you said again. That's why we have that attack? That's why we can resist this attack. Oh, that's why we it. have a okay. chance. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I wasn't hearing it quite right. Yes. Okay. Well, I may have not said it right, too. That's possible. Thank you for, clarify, for clarifying that. Now, MidAmerican Energy, and the, which is your supplier here, not mine. I have Alliant. Uh, you guys have a cheaper, at, actually, Alliant. You don't think it's... Um, uh, it's really expensive. <laughs> Mid-American has really gone crazy on wind power. They have a bunch of it. And they talk about getting to 85 per, having enough wind to supply 85% of all of their Iowa customers. Or it's not that they're only producing wind. 85% of their production is wind. That's not right because they're producing a lot of coal as well. But they export much more than they use. So their Iowa customers, 770,000 of them, are only a portion of all the customers they have. But still, if you have enough wind to cover 85% of all of your customers, you're doing pretty damn well. And back in 2017, there were two days in which all they produced so much wind power that all of their customers could be getting that. It's October, right? Not as much usage in October and April and times like that. Heavy usage happens in the middle of the summer, air conditioning, or middle of the winter, also a lot of uh, gas and, and some electricity. Okay, so anyway, MidAmerican's been doing some good stuff. Now let me say bad things about them. Next slide. <laughs> because why did they decide to do that? Why did they go so hard after renewable energy, we made them. 1983, Iowa passed what was the first law in the nation. It was, we didn't even know what to call it at the time. It's become a renewable portfolio standard. It says that you have to buy renewable energy from anybody in your area that wants to <coughs> give it to you. That had already been a federal law. But the federal law didn't really do it right. So what we did is to say the kind of price you have to pay for that power, and you have to do it. You don't want to do it? Too bad. We're making you do it. And that 1983 law w was really hard to get through because Mid-American, especially, called uh, Iowa Power at the time, took us to court, fought, 
won, actually, because the rules were too far, straight too far from the law. We thought about this in the 1990s. We changed it. And finally, in 1999, MidAmerican, because they had monopolized everything else, we used to have seven of these investor-owned utilities. It goes down to only two by uh, 1999. Alliant and MidAmerican go ahead and start doing wind power having fought it for all those years from 1983. And they found out, by God, this works. <laughs> what would it? Because people like Dick Cheney were saying we'd all freeze to death and, you know, if we ever did anything good with, uh, with energy. Our TVs will go off. Yes, we would. We'd lose TVs, right? Oh, no, and, and Trump's actually just said that. Uh, but anyway, it's try it, you'll like it. That's a pretty good piece of policy, and that piece of policy, I don't know how much that played a role, but it certainly played some role in getting Iowa way ahead of most other states. Next slide. Also helping that was the fact that right now, if you are going to build a new power plant someplace in the Midwest, the cheapest kilowatt hours you're going to be able to produce come from wind power. Bar none. If you're in the Southwest, it's solar. Every place else, it could be natural gas, and it's never going to be coal. Coal is dying, and it will be dead soon. Can't happen fast enough. Um, and uh, nuclear, people are mixed about nuclear. It does not produce uh, carbon dioxide, and that's a good thing. But that's a new plant, a new nuclear plant is silly. You just don't want to do that. You might want to nurse the old ones along a little. That's an environmental question of, where environmentalists disagree. But the point is, we are really moving in that direction, and much of the reason is also policy, because when we did, when Obama came in and did something about the deep financial and economic crisis we were in, he spent $30 billion on things like getting solar better. Lots of that brought that about. So policy is all over these places. But one of the reasons Mid-Am is doing all of the wind is, first of all, they had to do it. Second of all, it started getting cheaper. Third, they found out it really worked pretty, pretty well for their system. Next slide. And, and a pretty chunky piece of federal and state tax credits. And uh, those same <laughs> tax credits, just like the ones I talked about in solar, also exist, and we have to praise Chuck Grassley for that, because he was really the father of the uh, production tax credit for wind. And do those continue for the companies, David? Yes, they do. They continue. They've been going down, but people are talking in Congress about uh, extending those out again, and they may happen. No, uh, Chuck really did a good job on that. I don't have any reason to praise Chuck Grassley, but <laughs> he did. And when it came to that, he did good. Okay, here is something you can't see, but it is from a Iowa Policy Project report. I do this every two years, and I just notice it's March 2017. I guess I'm due to do another one. But what this graph is, this direction, it cents per kilowatt hour the cost of electricity in your state, okay? Here is years, and it starts in 1999, and goes on up to 2015. And so this line right here would say that, this is Iowa, in 1999, that's about how much it costs per kilowatt hour, on average, in the state. And so you take, but let me make sure you understand what this means. All of the different utility companies, some are investor owns. 70% of our electricity comes from Mid-Am and, and Alliant. Some are RECs, Rural Electric Co-ops, you've heard of those kinds of things. Sometimes the city, like just like they produce water for you, they also produce your electricity. Ames does that, Cedar Falls, Tipton. So you get all of those and you have different rates for big guys like industries. Uh, we pay more as residential. You put all that stuff together and you get one single number, and that's what that one single number is, going through time. Notice that Iowa is below the national average. That red line, national average, the blue line, Iowa. And it looks like it's getting further apart as we go forward. And also as we go forward, this is when we started the wind industry. 
more and more and more and more and more wind every single year, pushing up to where it's now pushing 40% of all of our electricity in the state is produced by wind power. I looked at that and said, you know that, that looks like it's getting, is that, is that, what's, what is that? Is that just cost? Is that inflation? Let me get inflation out of that. So the next slide. I take the inflation out and put everything into 2015 dollars. That's a pretty simple way to do that. Stuff back in 1999 is not comparable. It would probably cost us a different amount. So you put this together and there you have 2015 and you do see that we do get a little further apart even though we're getting more and more wind but the amazing thing, and the reason I, IPP got a lot of press on this, the cost of electricity in the state of Iowa in 1999 was exactly what it was in 2015, according to the best numbers there from our department. And, and those adjusted for inflation? They are adjusted for inflation. Okay. Exactly the same. So, so the I, I, and, 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 I'm sorry? What was the date? 1999, 2015. In 2015 dollars, yeah. precisely the same. Now, uh, let's, let's make sure, if I were talking to Catholics, I could probably speak a little more Latin, or I used to be, old Catholics <laughs> anyway. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. Just because I can show you that doesn't mean that wind power is the reason. Right? Could have been something else. Low rates come from all kinds of reasons. Washington State, where I grew up, had really low rates because of hydro. We don't, though. What exactly was the reason? That's the next slide. It's because we also passed another piece of legislation in 1990 that says you utility companies have to invest in the efficiency of your customers. You have to. It's a mandate. It's policy. And you had to have a program for low-income weatherization. Whether you wanted to, it's not your volition. Policy says you must. You had to have commercial lighting. You had to have residential rebates and audits. So if you bought a better air conditioner and the difference in price was 200 bucks, you might get that 200 bucks back from your utility company because you're not increasing their load at a really inconvenient time in the middle of an August day, right? That's why we got away with that. We passed it. We even made them do tree planting and stuff like that. All of it paid for by us customers, but all of it so efficient that it made sure that they did not have to build new power plants. And if you go with the previous slide again, Matt, that is why it's flat. It's because of efficiency, not necessarily because of wind. But it's energy policy, nonetheless. So, two slides ahead. We're getting there. Uh, next one. Yeah. So what does Mid-Am and uh, Alliant do? They kill energy efficiency. And they did that last year. And they had the power to do it. They ran right over us. And we had this coalition together and tried to fight. Looked like we might have a chance, but we got beat. How does that help climate change? How does that help climate change when Alliant... That, they were the perpetrator, but also Mid-American went along it, with it, cut their energy efficiency programs by about two-thirds. Instead of $5 million going to poor people to weatherize their homes, it's now $2 million. That's what they were able to do last year. And uh, we did our best. Wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. But now what Mid-Am is doing is trying to go after solar and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next five minutes and three slides. We're doing all kinds of stuff. Here's uh, the Center for Rural Affairs, another one of the members of the table saying, here's a contract, <coughs> contact your representative, tell them to vote no on House File 669. Uh, House File 669 would allow investor-owned utilities, Mid-American and, and Alliant, to charge homeowners and businesses that have clean energy systems additional fees, maybe. Or they could, it's many parts of it, they could do that, or they could just 
I tra charge me 17 cents for kilowatt hour for what I get from them and give me three cents for anything I give back to them even though I'm giving it to them in the middle of a hot day in August when they need it. That's their bill. We had just got beat last year, so we didn't think that this was going to be an easy thing to oppose, but we're opposing it. Next slide. And uh, they've really been coming hard. Probably we've seen these uh, advertisements on TV. They tend to come before Colbert reports, so I see them all the time. And it, it's coming in with, you know, pictures like this. Actually, this isn't their picture. This is wind power and solar power together. Very nice combination. Put a little bit of uh, storage, and you have a wonderful firm power way of producing electricity with no carbon dioxide. You're not warming the planet. But what they're saying is, you know, it's fine. Solar power is fine for these rich people, but why should you have to be paying for those rich people's panels? Arguing that somehow I am hurting all of my neighbors, and Peter Thorne, Peter and me are hurting our neighbors because we're not paying enough to keep their system going. Oh, come on. It's really a pretty dumb argument. And that kind of a dumb arg argument would generally be put down because these are monopolies, right? They're monopolies. They've been, they were set up as monopolies because that was the most efficient way to bring electricity. Think about it. Nine different companies giving you electricity, nine different power poles and lines and stuff. It just wouldn't work. So they said, okay, you get to be a monopoly, but you're going to be a regulated monopoly. You have to, in order to make changes like this, go before the IUB. They don't want to go before the IUB. They did really well by not going before the Iowa Utilities Board last year, right? When they killed energy efficiency, now they're trying to do the same thing. Next slide. We're fighting back, you know, as best we can. This was an op-ed I had in the Gazette uh, on March 30th. Teddy Roosevelt. Why would I talk about Teddy Roosevelt? He's a Republican. And also, he was a Republican who was an incredible conservationist. Most of us know that. All these national parks are brought to us by Teddy. But he was a trust buster because he knew that if you let big combines get together, they're going to crush small businesses. And so, what I'm trying to the point I'm trying to make is these are monopolies trying to use their monopoly power to kill good red-blooded American capitalists who want to put solar panels on your roof. That's, I think, true, but it's also a good argument because the Republicans dominate the legislature. Next slide. I think the last slide. And so here's House File 669. Remember all that work we did trying to get legislators to go ride on buses with, with Matt or with me or with somebody? It's paying off a little bit because they can't get this bill passed. They're having a heck of a time getting it passed. Right now, and this is the bill, an act relating to electric utility rates, infrastructure, support options for private generation, they got that through the Senate. They got it through the first committee, and it's now on the House floor, ready to be debated, except on Thursday, we got an amendment. Thirteen Republicans put on an amendment saying that we're striking everything after the enacting clause, we're changing this bill, and we're going to have the utilities board, which is the proper place to go, do a study to find out what the benefits of solar are and whether or not there is a good argument. Fifty-four Republicans in the House. They need 51 to pass something. So to just push things through the way they've been doing with, uh, you know, all the Republicans on one side and all the Democrats is going to be tough for them if they get 13 people who are saying, we have gone on record to say, we're not going to vote for this. But lots of stuff can happen. And of those 13, we have six hell no's. I'm not voting for this puppy no matter what you do to me, Linda Outmeyer. 
and we believe them. And she's the Speaker of the House. Speaker of the House. We could still get some Democrats because labor unions are on the wrong side of this. Jesus. So. And, uh, but right now, we're in pretty good position, but we're only going to be there if we keep the pressure up. So when Matt's saying, you got to write some letters, anybody in Bobby Kaufman's area? He is, well, if you're from, uh, if you're from Johnson County, Bobby Kaufman would be the person. He's not one of the 13. He ought to be. Claims to be this bipartisan guy, right? Right now he's trying to give us more gambling, but, but God, Bobby has always talked about how bipartisan he is. He's not on that amendment. How come he's not on Amendment 1207? That's the way I'd phrase this. Bobby, how come you're not on, on the amendment on House File 669, which calls for a study? I thought you uh, were educated. I thought you were bipartisan. What's wrong with you? We could get another vote. And it's all about getting enough votes. But you also have to support the people who voted correctly. One of them is my guy, Republican Louis Zumba, kind of an overweight farmer, you know? We don't, uh, it, it, we don't generally agree on a lot of things, except he was good on energy efficiency last year, and he's good on this one, and he's one of the hell knows. I've been trying to give him some support. I went up to meet him and talked to him. I think that we have to get some more votes because we can win this. Even though we got beat last year on energy efficiency, which unfortunately is the more important one, if we can stop Mid-American from saying, we want to have lots of solar, and this goes back to the where I'm going to finish because it segues into scarcity, but only we. There ain't enough sun out there. Peter Thorne's going to have panels on his house. we got to punish people like him in the future by charging them more. But then we will go ahead and do, just like we did in wind power, we're going to do more solar. That's their argument. It's not scarcity. They can do it. And we can also have each one of us put in more solar ourselves. And because solar is a problem in many houses, maybe you don't own your house, maybe you got trees in front of you, like I do. God, I have beautiful trees in front of me, my neighbor's trees. Uh, so I, I enjoy the neighbor's trees, but they sure don't help me get any solar. Uh, but So it'd be better if we had another way that all of us could do a, a mass buy of solar Put it someplace where there's good location and get the same kind of net metering deal. That's what, that's what would be a great piece of policy. That's policy in Illinois right now. That's policy in Minnesota right now. We could get even better policy, but first we have to defeat the bad stuff, and it's bad. <coughs> but I'm giving what I'm saying to you is it's, we seem to be not getting kicked around quite as bad as we did last year, Robin. Yeah, David, what is the rationale that the supporters of making solar investor-owned, what is their rationale for that? They say, I'm not buying enough kilowatt hours. Therefore, I pay for my kilowatt hours that I use, but there's more costs than that. So we all need to be really wasteful and use a whole lot of electricity to pay for everything else all of their other things that are not based on cost per kilowatt hour. That's their argument. Crazy argument, really. I produce, in five years, I produce only 10,000 kilowatt hours, about 2,000 a year. I only gave 2,000 of them back to the company. I use nearly as much as I did before. It's a crazy, stupid argument, but that's their argument. Your argument, Robin, is you're not using enough electricity, therefore somebody over here is going to have to pay more of those fixed costs. What That's about municipally owned utilities? Yes. Uh, do they, I mean, are they going to penalize uh, like Cedar Falls and so on? They and haven't. Make them no, more? Cedar Falls went the opposite direction. Cedar Falls put in a 1.5 megawatt solar array uh, 
many times bigger than the one I just passed coming in here, and let their customers buy into it. No, they did quite the opposite. Not, but not all municipal, municipal utilities are good, and not all of them are bad. Some of the RECs are beautiful, some of them are terrible. It's kind of who's running this thing, and it's kind of the mindset. Just like when we passed that 1983 law, all we were doing is taking a baseball bat and hitting these guys on the head so they'd look in this direction also. You have to make policy change the decisions at the top. Right now, mid-Americans doing terrible things. They would not necessarily have to do that. And, but it is short run versus long run. It is scarcity thinking that we need to take care of our own here and to heck with climate change because that's what they're going against. More solar, we're taking on climate change, no question. Harry. So what impact, if, if that passes without the amendment, what, what impact would that have on places like us? Like it would the depend. US? It would depend because it's a, it's a bill that says we could do this or we could do that. And the way it's written. One thing they could do, I, I make on my solar every year about $350. One of the proposals in this bill is to put a fee on anybody who has solar of $380, erasing anything that I would gain. So they've talked about that, they've talked about that they're only going to apply that going forward? Forward, so not to me. But there is some, there is some skepticism because of the bill that it's the way it's written that that whether they would get, whether they could start to incrementally creep into adding charges to existing places. So that it's not solid that, that it only applies forward, although that's what they've been saying. And, and clearly the bill does apply anything that's not grandfathered in that's not already existing. But why would you believe them? Right. I mean, yeah. if they just did this, why would you believe that they wouldn't yeah. come back that and, the grandfather? And so another really important thing is that it moves oversight away from the IUB, the Iowa Utility Board, and puts it in the legislature where they have a better track record of winning in their minds around their agenda. And you said the argument, their argument is that, and if you've seen the commercials, if you've gotten a robocall, they're spending hundreds if not, hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars trying to push this through with campaigns. And one of the things I heard is that a legislator got calls from out of state, from out of state donors, that that called them and said, you know, we'd like you to vote for this bill. So the speculation is that they're even going through donor lists and and identifying, you know, donors of current legislators and calling them and saying, would you please? And they they frame it all in a pro solar. So all these, if you've seen the ads, they're all talking about. We want to expand solar, but to do it, we have to do this. Well, the real argument is that they want to, I mean, if you break it apart, is they want to protect future profits. Because as solar expands and the price goes down, and if under existing, we're going to accelerate how many small farms, or farms and small businesses and homes and churches expand solar. And that's going to take profit away from them. It's not going to cost them anything in terms of the grid. But it's going to it's going to take away future potential profits. That's what they're trying to protect. But if you go to the state house and you say we're trying to protect our future profits, that's a dead. Nobody's right. going to. But if you frame it as people are paying these costs that that you know aren't fair, well that starts to get people's attention. And when they've spent probably in millions rather than hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to move this forward. You kind of get an idea of how big of a piece of profit they feel like is at risk. And, and they're doing really unbelievable things, like making phone calls to people and saying, hello, real, not robocalls, real people calling and saying, uh, this is what's happening. In order to protect solar and in order to be fair, did you know that you're paying for other people's solar and we need to fix that? Would you be willing to allow us to send a, a letter to your representative? And if you say yes, then they're generating a letter from you. To, this is really expensive political action. We, we can't do that kind of political action. What we can do 
is these kind of workshops, get people to write handwritten letters, do that strategically, and, and then write letters to the editor. And so this is our last workshop on like letters to, to, to representatives. We're now going to shift to asking people to write letters to the editor. So today we're asking you to write to the representative and to the governor, because if this passes, the governor needs to veto it. So we're already starting to prep her to let her know. The other piece of this economically is that there are 800 solar installation jobs in Iowa, and they're growing, and there's small businesses that are developing these solar installation projects, and they've been growing. This law will, will stop that growth, and, and the majority of those jobs will be at risk. And so those small businesses that are all across the state are likely to, to move to another state or to redirect and, and the job growth that has been happening and that's possible in the future will literally grind to a halt. And it's happened in Maine, it's happened in Nevada. And then they went back and, and had to fix it after their solar installation industry was decimated. So we have the opportunity to avoid that mistake. And we're winning on it so far. So far. Boy, their, their response here sounds like an incredible endorsement for solar, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're fighting it that yeah, hard. Right. It is that efficient. It is yeah. that yes. good. Because <laughs> they only have 750 customers now, mid amp Right, right. Out of 770,000 who have, I mean, it's equivalent of uh, six of their turbines. That's all. Yeah. But it's the future. Do you have any sense on, like, this amendment seems like it's, sets up the governor to have an easier way of vetoing this going, and it also send it to helps. your board, governor. Yeah. Yeah. 